Yugoslavia, um, but also and more importantly about how they channel their pain into forces of change, of truth and reconciliation. The discussion within the panel will shed light on how victims and victim families can become not only the objects of discussion and reconciliation participants in peace building um, in the Balkans. Um, the, the format of the panel will be such that uh, I will ask uh, a couple introductory questions. Um, and then uh, we'll invite questions from the audience. There's two ways in which you can pose your questions. One, um, as you've been told, is through the, the app, uh, I understand, uh, and they'll appear on the screen and we'll uh, filter them and uh, um, ask the questions that, um, uh, that get kind of most endorsements from, uh, from the audience, but also feel free, um, we'll have two rounds uh, of audience questions, so if you um, uh, don't want to go through the app, if you want to um, uh, speak and uh, ask your question that way, just raise your hand um, and uh, you'll be given a microphone and uh, um, you can ask your question that way. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for uh, taking part at the, the Skopje Youth Summit and uh, for being here with us. Um, as a start, I would like to ask uh, all three of you to, to briefly present um, yourselves and, and your stories, um, but also to tell us about um, your activism and your public service and uh, what you try to, to achieve with it, what you uh, try to do with your, uh, with your voice and, and your service. We can start with you. Okay. Hello, uh, thank you for having me here. Yeah, my name is Aina Jusic and I'm uh, from Bosnia, from Sarajevo. Uh, so, the, the part, I will tell you the, the small part of my story. And uh, so, the, in Bosnia we survived the war and during the war my mom survived the war rape. She was raped when uh, she was uh, 22 and the product of uh, that rape is me. So I mean, the, some definitions that some people gave me, I am the child born out of uh, war rape. And uh, my story uh, starts in that point because um, uh, I don't know how to explain you, but uh, there is no word how to explain uh, the life as a result of uh, destroying of human dignity and a result of the rape. Uh, the, 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 my activism starts in that point when I realize that I'm invisible for 25 years in my country. And uh, when I just saw the world who don't want to accept me, you know, I was in society who had uh, two reasons to reject me. First one was that uh, my mom was 22 and she has a baby, but she hasn't a uh, husband. The other, the other thing was that uh, society called me a child of hate, child of war crime, child of um, like destroying of the future because they think that I will continue to do all these crimes because I am the result of the crime, of the rape. And uh, I had a wish to show everyone that I am a child of love and that I know how to love and I want to be loved, you know, and I think that uh, as a human being I deserve to be loved and I deserve to be accepted. Also my activism was the um, idea of destroying of the, war, of the rape, cultural rape in the world, you know, every, every single day today when I talk here in the Skopje, there is women in the world who in this moment surviving the rape and for a few days we will have another child born out of rape and it's not okay, you know, we live in the world where um, uh, human dignity and human life and human body are, li are like worthless, you know, we don't uh, live in the world when we can respect every everything that we are, that we are human beings and that we have our human rights and the uh, point of my of my activism is to to stop the world where we are approve approve rape you know because there is a million reasons of uh, approving the rape like uh, rape is okay because women had uh, 
she was drunk and she got raped. It's not, it's not okay. In every min minute where we respect a rape culture, we are like um, people who don't deserve to, to, to have anything because uh, I know how is uh, to live in the society who cut you off everything, you know. Uh, my goal is also to to show you that my mom has a that she is a hero. She is really a hero, and uh, there is no reason to blame her because she survived the rape, and there is no reason to put her in the dark and uh, call her like the worst name. You know, my mother she was a whore whole life is the point. Society call her in that name and it's not, it's not okay. She doesn't want to be unrespected, you know. And uh, it was one of my reasons uh, why I started the story of the Association Forgotten Children of War, because I need to, I needed to send my voice, I needed to, to explain to someone that uh, Okay, I am a result of uh, rape, but uh, I believe in humanity because uh, every single Sunday in my life, I had some uh, lessons from my mother and she always told me like, okay, I know there is bad people, but there is, bad, there is no bad nations in the world. And you need to understand that humanity can save this world. And because of that, I'm here today with you because I think that humanity and solidarity can make us a better future. And uh, if you maybe, you can ask me about the worst thing that I survived. I was... Uh, for example, the best example that I was always sit alone in the school, always, because I was a child of hate, because my mom was a bad woman and she is blamed because she survived the rape. And it's, it's not okay. And uh, because of that, I'm here today with you to share my story, to share my experiences, to share my hopes, because um, I think that if we act together, we can change something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aina. Yes, Zia, please. Uh, I'm Zia Ribic, and I'm from Tuzle, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, Moja životna priča počinje 1992. godine na početku rata. Poreklo sam Rom i u moje selo je pobijeno 32. Od toga moji šije sestri, brat, majke, otac i ja sam bio tu, preživio sam streljanje. Uh, good day to all. My name is Zio Ribic. I come from Tuzla, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, my life story begins in 1992 with the beginning of the war in Bosnia. I'm um, Roma by nationality and in my village uh, 32 people were killed, including my six sisters, brother, mother and father, whereas I survived. Uh, I Posle mnogo godina sam počeo govoriti o tome jednostavno zato što sam uvidio da u Bosni i Hercegovini pričaju o samo tri naroda dok mi koji spadamo u ostale vrlo malo se spominje. I jednostavno kao država Bosna i Hercegovina sama nije htjela ni da čuje moju priču Usto mi je pomoglo Fond za humanitarno pravo prvi puta iz Beograda gospođa Nataša Kandić. Uh, I started uh, talking about this at the very beginning because in my country in Bosnia and Herzegovina everyone seems to speak about the three nations which are constitutional whereas we who are minorities in that country 
uh, no one wants to hear our voice at all. First time I got the help from the Fund for Human Rights uh, in Belgrade by Ms. Natasha Kandic. I uz pomoć nje sam nastavio i dalje da govorim o tome što se desilo Roma u Bosni i Hercegovini, tačnije u mom selu, mojoj porodci i meni samom. I uz moju priču sam hteo da kažem i da pokušam da narodima, odnosno najviše omladima, da pokušam da ne govore o mržnje, da živimo u nekakvom boljem svijetu bez neke mržnje. Međutim, u Bosni i Hercegovini je vrlo teško o pomirenju pričati i svaki dan sve više se priča o mržnji, a ne o nekom boljem sutra, nažalost. She helped me to spread my story, to speak more of what happened in my village with my family uh, and me, myself, of course. I wanted to share a message with the people in Bosnia, especially the youth, to stop speaking about hate. However, in Bosnia and Herzegovina it is hard to do this. People seem to speak more of hate as they do of reconciliation. And I would love this to stop. Za moje selo je osuđeno samo oni trojica dok su ostali oslobođeni i to su osuđeni samo za silovanje i za pljačkanje dok nije niko osuđen za ubijstvo na dromima. A to mi daje još veću snagu da idem napred, da se borim za pravdu, a uz to i Naravno da se borim za pomirenje, bez mržnje, jer dosta imam prijatelja koji nisu Romi, a koji su dobri ljudi i koji čak misli isto kao i ja. In my village, for these crimes, only three people were convicted and not for murder, but only for a rape, so no murder or the Rama people. However, this gave me the strength and courage to continue my fight for reconciliation. Also, I have many people that are not Rama, but they are good people and they think as I do. Oh. Thank you. Hello, and uh, thanks for having me uh, here today. Um, we share very um, similar stories. Um, I survived a massacre in, in Kosovo in uh, March 1999, um, where I lost um, eight members of my family. I was very badly injured uh, from 21 people who apart from two of them who were old men, the rest were women and children. Um, only four, cousin, um, four of my cousins and myself survived. Um, and unfortunately it was the same unit that uh, took part in the Srebrenica massacre a few years earlier in Bosnia. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, um, it started during the war when I was in hospital in Pristina where for, I can't tell you the reason why, but it just was in my head that it was really important to tell my story. And I think it also linked very much that, um, you know, um, what happened to my family was un unacceptable. They didn't deserve that. Um, they didn't do anything to anyone and um, it was very difficult to come to terms with. Um, later on after the, um, the war, I was uh, medically evacuated to Manchester because of my injuries, uh, along with my cousins. And then over there, um, opportunity came where I could speak more about what had happened. And 
slowly I realized that it's really important to talk about these stories as difficult as they are. Um, but it's important for people to understand the impact that it has on individuals, on families, on societies. And it made me think, what's the outcome of all of this? You know, what did we achieve by what happened? Uh, apart from many lives being lost, um, many um, places destroyed, and then also a burden that's been created for the generations to come. Uh, and we see that happening, um, happening now. Um, I was quite fortunate with, with my family that we were able to go through uh, um, uh, trials where some of the men were convicted. This also with the uh, support and help of the Humanitarian Law Center, uh, both in Belgrade and in Pristina, um, and many other people around us. Um, when I was in England, um, I used to do a lot of talks with schools telling my story. But that, what that made me realize is that, you know, um, even if it's not war, there's one form or the other, that differences are being created between communities. Um, and that's because one feels that it's more superior to others. And, um, and I realized that we're only human beings, you know, we're, we're the same, we go um, beyond this imposure of growing up with um, believing that there were more worthy than others uh, as communities um, that if you go beyond that you know we're just human beings that we have same dreams same desires for life and many things in in common so being where I am um, you know it's not because I decided to be. Life threw me in it, and then I realized that I had a responsibility. Um, and uh, it's more actually of my responsibility because I experienced it firsthand that I felt that I needed to do something to raise awareness. Um, and also, um, to reach out. Um, later on, I got into into politics in in, in Kosovo uh, as member of parliament, and then um, what I learned out of that as well is that throughout different times and difficult times, you also acknowledge the aspect of how lucky you are to have people around you who've supported you throughout this journey. And then unfortunately, the majority of people don't have that. Um, and it made me think a lot about what do we do? And how do we provide these support and opportunity for people to be able to deal with what had happened to them? But also, how do we change societies to think differently? And, you know, things like this are really important. And meetings like this and, um, and part of reconciliation is that process of dealing with what had happened. Um, unfortunately, we have this sort of push that there needs to be reconciliation within the former Yugoslavian countries and what happened there. Um, but actually it's what we provide for people, for them first to be able to deal with what they've gone through. Um, and justice, which is also very important, and how we change societies, and then we get, we get to that part of reconciling a thing with, with each other. So, thank you, I'll leave it at that.
thank you so much for, for sharing this. I know that um, uh, talking about this is, is not easy and that these discussions are hard, but um, uh, what I hope we're achieving with this is that uh, um, uh, stories like yours and especially the way you speak about them are uh, really making the, the uh, values that we often speak about, like human rights and human dignity, uh, they're making them uh, very tangible. Um, uh, I think that's extraordinarily uh, important and, and, and helpful for everybody who um, uh, who works in human rights, who, who sees themselves in, in public service. Um, I remember when uh, I'm from Petrinja in, in Croatia, a small town that was um, uh, directly affected by the conflict. And I remember when we came back after after the war, that I was surrounded by people who were directly affected by violence and injustices. And I've, uh, growing up, um, I've, I've witnessed so many people using those facts um, to foster hate, uh, not love, not reconciliation. They used it as an excuse not to approach the other side, not to try and understand anybody else's perspective, um, or even to prove that um, the people who, who did this and the collectives they represent um, are, are filled with hatred uh, towards us. Um, yet all three of you um, are, are prominent voices for peace and for reconciliation. And uh, when, when you speak about this, um, and then today in this panel too, um, you all spoke about love, about reconciliation, about coming together. Um, why is that? Uh, where do you think you, you found it in yourselves um, to, to become some, such prominent voices for, for peace and reconciliation, to go through um, what you went through and, um, and yet uh, focus on, on the good in people and um, try to contribute to that? So when we talk about peace, justice, and reconciliation, so I always want to tell that um, this way of peace that we live now, it's not okay. It's not good. <laughs> so it's the point that I think that um, we need to change something in this process because uh, if uh, we are on, if we are on the good way when we talk about justice, the most. Um, Maybe the hardest example is that uh, we are not on the good way because my mom hide the truth from me for 15 years because she was scared that I will reject her because society rejected her because she she survived the rape. I think that uh, the peace, I, on, I felt on my skin that this process of peace, justice and reconciliation are not the best we can do, you know, because we still uh, we are just uh, players of the big um, political scene and uh, we talk about some movements but we don't talk about the, about this first question, role of, of them in this process, you know. We can do something in our, you know, in our um, homes, in our neighborhood, but we need to change the process of the political scene in our countries because uh, we had a war in Bosnia and that war destroyed many lives and now we live in Bosnia and we just talk about uh, numbers. We talk about uh, numbers of all people who lost their lives and now in this year we are, I think that we are aware that uh, they lost their lives for nothing because this uh, way of living now is, I think, is the worst of, you know, I think the war is in the past, and if we want to be better society, and if we want to build a better future, we need to talk about uh, all consequences of war. It's unemployment, it's uh, hungry, and uh, in the one moment you have consequences who breathing and walking every single day, and you have one consequences of war, and it's me, and I'm here today with you. And please, can we talk with these guys, politicians, that they cannot just talk about numbers, they need to, to create a numbers of, of 
opportunities in our countries, you know, because I'm, I'm maybe disappointed because um, I live with young people who, who are younger than me and they came and they talked me about 1992 and I'm okay. It was a war and I respect everything that we survived during the war, but let's talk about um, 10 years in future, you know. We cannot build our future in the past, you know. We can build our future now and in the future, and this is a problem. And I think that uh, every time when we just stay quiet on all these decisions that politicians made every single day, it's our fault. It's our fault. For example, my mom, is, she's not guilty because she survived the rape, but I'm guilty because I'm, um, I vote and I don't do nothing after this voting, you know. And uh, I need to tell you that the moment when you decide to go into the fight with the political parties and things, it's not, it's not easy. I got like thousands of thousands of messages of hate speech, of, um, you know, the, the like, um, I got this one message before six months, you need to be raped because you talk about these things. You, don't, you cannot forgive all the people who, who raped, you know, you cannot for, forgive, the, for, forgive for the thing that your mom survived. Okay, the point is that if I go into the past and I stay there, I cannot do anything. In Bosnia, we have three sides, but I believe in my three sides, and they are the humanity, solidarity, and empathy, because I think it's the only point of the living, and it is, this is the only way that we can uh, do something. And the politicians, they are like uh, wolves. I call them a wolves, but we can, we can win them if we act together, and uh, if we show them that uh, way of our peace, way of our justice, and way of our reconciliation are better than, than theirs. Mene navelo da se borim za mir, za pomirenje, zato što sam ja odrastao u domu i najviše je u domu djece bilo bez roditelja ili posleratne djece. Vidio sam dosta djece koje govore mržnje prema drugoj naciji koji jel, nisu ili bošnjačke ili srpske, hrvatske, I to mi je nekako bio trn, ja kažem, jer nasilje i mržnja, to ne volim ni da vidim, ni da čujem. Jednostavno sam počeo prvo sa prijateljima u domu koji sam odrastao da govorim da ne mrzimo nekog drugog zato što se zove nekim drugim imenom ili zato što se drugačije moli Bogu, nego jednostavno da pokušamo da gledamo kao čoveka. Međutim, vrlo tiško je, pogotovo djeci, prijateljima mojim, koji su iz Srebrenice došli, koji su se rodili 1995. ili tokom rata, i onda o svojih starijih rotelja ili prijatelja ili tako uče, odnosno učili su o mržnji. Ali sam, ja mislim, uspio dosta svojih prijatelja iz doma, odnosno iz Srebrenice, da okrenem nekom boljem, kako bi rekao, da gledaju na bolje. Jer sam spojio prošlost i sadašnjost, I onda Inka, sam im rekao, ako spojimo prošlost i sadašnost, prošlost je bio rat između naroda i nismo dobili ništa, niti jedna strana nije dobila, a sadašnost opet ništa ne dobijamo, samo mržnju. Hajmo stvarati nešto bolje. I dosta prijatelja je 
se ukrenulo ka tom bolje. Čak dosta prijatelja je sa mnom išlo koji nikad nisi tijel da idi u Srbiju ili se bojali. I kad smo išli u Srbiji vidjeli su da u stvari tamo narod isti koji u Bosnu. Um, I was inspired to fight for peace and reconciliation uh, when I was um, in this uh, in this juvenile home where I actually uh, grew up and I grew up with many kids uh, whose parents would teach them of uh, hate and uh, to hate other nations I've met many kids many children that were um, that were hating uh, that bothered me a lot uh, because I don't like violence, I don't like hate. Um, it was the first time that I was with my friends and we swore that we do not hate any other nation and that we see a human as he or she is. Um, but it is, I think, very hard to explain that to people from Srebrenica, especially children born uh, during the war or at the end of the war in 1995 because their parents um, really feed their hate. However, I think that I've managed to do something with my friends and to turn them to a better direction of uh, love instead of hate. I have uh, binded the past and the present. My concrete uh, words were that in the past we had the war and no one won. In the present we have hate, so again no one won, so let's create something better. Um, I even uh, made many friends who didn't want to go to Serbia uh, to come with me and uh, see that the people there are just like us. Kao što sam rekao, dosta sam znači promijenio te moje prijatelje da misle na bolje. To jest da ne misle u mržnje. I dosta puta i dan danas kad pričamo uvijek ta tema, politika, ja kažem, hajde, evo ja, primjer sebe, oprostio sam, zašto? Zato što ne želim da se puno vraćam non stop u taj prošlost, ali sam oprostio zbog toga da hoću da idem naprej da živim, bez te mržnje, da imam prijatelja, a ne da imam Srbina, Hrvata, muslimana, ili nekog desna, nego prijatelja, jednostavno. I tako da i dan danas pokušavam, ali vrlo tiško je u Bosni i Hercegovini, o pomirenju, o nekakvom bolje sutra pričati, ali nadam se da će kroz vremena možda neke druge generacije koje dolaze da pokušaju da oni promene tu situaciju. Hvala. Uh, as I said earlier, I managed to change a few friends and make them stop thinking about hate. When we speak about politics, uh, for example, I have forgiven because I don't want to live in the past. I want to move forward to have friends rather than Croats, Serbs or Muslims. However, it is hard in Bosnia to speak of a better tomorrow. However, I hope that future generations can change that. Thank you. I agree with um, Anna when she said about um, looking to the future. But one thing that I learned is that it's really important also to deal with the past, to be able to move, on, to move forward in the future. And one of the most important thing is the acknowledgement of those that uh, suffered the most, the survivors, the victims, from whichever side it might be. And I think it's really, all of these things play a huge role in terms of um, how we look to the future and what happens in the future. Um, for me, um, it's really important, and I've talked a lot about this as well, is that I feel that we need to deal with that past 
and so that we don't leave a burden for the uh, for the younger generations, because if we don't deal it, it's that burden is going to be passed on. And what I mean by dealing with with the past is not only from the perpetrator side, but even within the countries that we live in. How do we treat the people who've suffered? How do we treat um, uh, the survivors and the families and uh, the women who've survived um, rape and how do we treat the families of the missing persons. It's not just about whether their families have been found, but it's how are we treating those families on a daily basis and how we're supporting them uh, and what are they having to deal with. Because the, pro the and this is just for many aspects, uh, that I've seen happening, that, you know, um, yes, we are some, and I, and I say this because that's how I really see it and feel about it, but there are a few lucky ones that we've been able to have the support and the platform to do something about what we've experienced. But what you find out is that the majority of people don't have that, don't have that kind of support, don't have that kind of platform, even to talk about their experiences, let alone uh, anything happening. So if you talk to them about reconciliation, it's really tough because they're saying, well, why? Why should I do that when I've, been, I've gone through all of that and I've been left to suffer years and years after? So this worry brings back in terms of responsibility of society as well, and especially politics and, and everything. Um, and it's what do we do collectively to get people through that experience, hear them, give them a voice if justice is not possible. Uh, but at least what we can do in, the, in, 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 in that aspect. Um, and this is what we really need to, to, to look into. And I think once you go th through these processes, um, what I found is that, you know, uh, the way then you pass on things to the younger generations, is, it's, it's different. Um, and also you find that you see things differently when you experience something firsthand. And you see something differently when you hear those stories. Um, and for me, it's been really important when, when I spoke about my story, I always, especially when I spoke into schools, I always, at the end of my, my talk, will always say, I'm not telling you this story so that you can hate Serbs. I'm telling you this story so you understand the impact that it has on people, on families. And this is not just about the war, but an action that you take at a specific time. The things that you say to the other and what you do, even beyond war and, 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 and conflict. Um, so it's a process, you know, the way I see it, it's, it's, uh, it's a process. And as I, said, as I said before, you know, you, you see that this is also your responsibility, especially when you experience it firsthand. Um, I mean, I used to think, I was still a child, but I used to think about all of these things. And then I said, you know, if, if I'm going to hate, how am I any different to the people that did what they did to me? What makes me so different to them? And, um, and then also acknowledgement that from each society, yes, you have bad and good people. And you have to acknowledge that as well. Uh, but also for me, what's been really important, and I've thought a lot about this as well, why? Why did we get to that point? It's not just a simple hate between each other. It's something that's been built up and built up and built up, and why that has happened, and how do we learn from that, and how do we change it? I mean, it was really interesting for me um, a few years ago, maybe, 10 years ago or so, I, I read this article where there was this fight between uh, which country in the Balkan owned Ivar, you know? And I was like, 
everyone makes it, everyone eats it, and it's everyone's. So what does it matter who's, you know, who takes ownership of it? Uh, as simple, you know, as that, even that is a fight between. So, um, so what do we, how do we learn from, from, um, from that experience? And just another thing that I want to, to point out, because I've seen it also happening in terms of this acceptance and this part of being able to have that dialogue between each other, that somehow it's sort of portrayed that you need to sort of not sort of express yourself of who you are. And I always say, you know, it's, it's fine for you to be proud of who you are. I'm proud to be who I am. I'm proud to be Albanian, you know. I'm proud to be the culture that I come from. But that does not mean that I, someone else who's proud of who they are and of their background is less worthy than, uh, um, than me. So it's how do we learn to to be proud of who you are, but also to appreciate who someone else is and the, prou the proudness that they have of who they are as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, as you see, we have uh, quite a few questions from, um, uh, from the audience. Um, the one that was on top until recently is this one. Uh, uh, what helped you or how did you manage to find peace and heal from your past experiences? Um, but I would like to add to that. I would like to, to ask you, um, uh, when, when you started speaking out and when you started speaking out in the, the direction of uh, peace and reconciliation and love and coming together, um, as, as you said to your, uh, your friends and uh, the, the communities around you, uh, what were the, the responses of, of people around you? Um, uh, not necessarily politicians and, 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 in, and in public, but um, on a more intimate level, uh, people you are sur surrounded with um, daily, how did they uh, uh, react um, uh, to your activism and when you started speaking out? So, um, uh, society in Bosnia, they, they were shocked because they were, they were like, okay, I spent 25 years and I didn't even think about the results of rape. But I have, you know, I have information that there is like 50,000 of rape women in Bosnia, but I never was thinking about the results. The only thing that our society was... Um, Faced with it was uh, blame and shame, you know. And after 25 years, I just stand in front of them and I told them, like, okay, I'm that result. And you, okay, you can touch me. I am human being, but I'm not. I don't want to be just a number. And I'm that uh, child of hate. I'm that. Uh, um, child from the movie Gerbavica, if you maybe, it's a movie about me and my mother. And they, they were just shocked, you know, but after that uh, I got uh, very, very positive reactions. And of course you always have these few um, cute guys who talk about sites and ethnic things and everything. And um, But the most important thing is that um, um, now, in this moment, I understand that our society need more time for everything, you know, because they face with me and after me, I stand in front of them and uh, I told them, okay, I want to meet you with someone. My friend, she is a peacekeeper's baby. She mother, uh, her mother survived the rape by, by peacekeeper. Let's talk about this category, you know, in, when we talk about children born of war, it's not just a child born out of rape you know, child born out of rape from the enemy soldiers and things. Okay, we have peacekeepers babies, we have humanitarian babies here in Bosnia. But the thing is that um, this um, positive reaction I got from society, they are the biggest motivation for me. And also the, the moment when I got a um, few calls and uh, it was calls from the women survivors and uh, it was the first time that they talk about that is the point 
you know, okay, because if we are quiet, this whole thing will be just continued, you know, and uh, the make um, the point of the point of voice is, um, you know. I don't have a definition <laughs> like this voice for me is something unbelievable, you know, and uh, I am always um, happy when someone notices that my voice are, is my therapy. Just like answer on this question, my voice is my therapy because uh, uh, I was very quiet for 25 years and I just crying and crying and I just trying to imagine other life, you know, because I'm not happy with this one. But I'm now in this moment I'm the happiest one, you know. I'm very proud and <laughs> Yeah and um, <laughs> I, I I forgot what, what was the question. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Kad govorim sa prijateljima i tako sa ljudima o pomirjenju, o tome svemu, normalno vrlo tiško prifačaju prvo da ne mrze, drugo kako da oproste nešto što se desilo. Ali kroz vremena kad prođe sva te neke stvari, I onda i mene pitaju, znači isti si, ono, kako sam ja oprostio i dalje. I onda, ovaj, tako da i oni to pokušavaju, ali normalno, vrlo tiško je. Kada sam bio, eto, u domu, kad izdašao iz doma, ovaj, ima kuća za mlade gdje djeca iz doma borave, prvi godinu, dvije, dok se ne snađu. I tu je moj jedan prijatelj iz Srebrenice, isto iz doma tu bio. I drugi prijatelj je pitao me, pošto sam bio kao presednik u toj kući, da li može da dovede jednog prijatelja iz Banja Luke, koji je isto u domu, samo srpske nacionalnosti, da bude preko vikenda. Ja sam rekao da nema problema, nek dođe. Međutim, dok je ovaj drugi iz Srebrenica momak rekao, ja ne bih volio da on dolazi ovde i da tako i dalje. Ali pošto sam kao prijesednik, normalno na kraju je došao. Mi smo sjedili za večeru i tako pričali, malo kao i što tu među omlad najviše politika, I njih dvojica su počeli pričati o tom ratu, one naravno na svoju stranu, ona svoju, Srebrenica i tako dalje. Mi smo i otišli, legali spavati, oni su čitavu noć svađali, prepravili, svađali i tako. Da bi sljedeći dan i otišli na kafu zajedno i sve. I dan danas su postali dobri prijatelji. Ja kažem sad tom mom prijatelju, vidiš da nisu svi isti, jer i on je dijete rata kao i ti. I zato ne treba da mrziš nekog drugog, samo zato što je druge nacije. I meni je drago da sam uspeo da tim mojim prijateljima najviše otvorim oči ka nekom boljem svijetu, da vide da nisu svi krivi, pogotovo ne ta generacija koja se rodila u ratu ili posle rata. When I was a kid, we were... Sorry. Yes, when I was a kid we used to talk a lot about reconciliation and out of that I came to the conclusion that people 
really accept uh, not to hate and they have this question on how to forgive. However, uh, as time goes by, they finally understand. They used to ask me a lot, how did I do it? How did I forgive? And then they would try to use the same tactics, but uh, for many of them, it is uh, really hard. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, uh, in the home for kids without parents where I grew up, there was this friend from Srebrenica. Um, and there was this other one. I was the president of a sort in that, at that time, at that facility. And I was asked the question, if a friend from Banja Luka, who is a Serb, can come and visit during the weekend. Uh, my friend from Srebrenica, who was a Bosniak, uh, said that he would rather if the Serbian kid wouldn't uh, come. However, because I was the president, he did came. Uh, over dinner, we discussed politics, of course, and these two guys started talking about the war, and they were pretty much fighting all the time. I went to bed, they continued their fight. However, the next morning over coffee, they actually uh, came along quite well, and today they are even good friends. Uh, even today, when I meet my friend from Srebrenica, I ask him, so, did you see the result? Not all people, uh, not all people are bad. You don't have to hate anyone because of a different nation than yours. And I'm glad that I have managed to open the eyes of many friends for them to see that not all people are uh, to blame for what happened, especially not the generations during, uh, that were born during the war or after it. Thank you. The question. <laughs> sure. I um, um, I asked uh, about how how did people around you uh, react when you uh, started speaking out uh, about your story and when you started engaging in, in public service and activism. Um, of course, the story that I, I was telling in in many ways was very shocking for people so unfortunately most of the time you don't really get um, many comments on that um, but um, one the great thing was when I was working with kids they always ask questions so um, um, so it was always this is a trying to get them to understand what it means and the, the impact that that it that it had. Um, but for me, I think, so after the war ended, probably the first contact that I had uh, with someone who was Serbian was uh, Natasha Kandic. And that's because we were invited in 2003, in fact, before uh, uh, 2003, but in 2003, we traveled to Belgrade uh, to testify against, um, well, one of the men who, who committed the crime, uh, the other one had fled to Canada. Um, I had just turned 18, so I was still um, a child. And, you know, I, I do remember thinking, you know, if, if, if we can trust them, if we can trust her, um, will we be safe to, to go? Um, and of course, so many people were involved that, you know, um, one of the, the people that I trust the most, it's HLC and, uh, and of course, Natasha and, um, so it took time, of course, but for me, the most interesting experience I had with young people from, um, different communities within the Balkans was when I went to Canada, I did an exchange on my second year at university. And where I stayed, there was a huge Albanian community, Croatian community, Serbian community, um, and, and from different parts of, of, of the Balkans. And these young people um, were mainly um, younger than me, uh, who some of them had been born in Canada. Some of them were very young when they went to, to Canada. 
And it was really interesting how, what's be, what was passed on to these young people. Um, you know, uh, you'd had all sorts of different debates during the day, and then they went out, and then no one really cared about who, who you were. You know, they, they wanted to hang out, they were friends. Uh, and of course, the, the burden that they had was mainly what was passed on to them from families, rather than actually what they knew or what they were experienced themselves. And of course, they were growing up in, in, in Canada. They didn't even sort of had any sort of day-to-day -day living experience within the Balkans. Um, and then for me, it was really interesting to see because of course, the majority uh, of the young people from the Serbian community that I met there had already found out about my story. So it was very interesting that first interaction that I had. And uh, a lot of the times I, I saw them, they didn't even know if they could say hello, if they could, you know, uh, uh, have a handshake. And they were just really waiting to see how I would react towards them. It was much more actually than how I thought they would react towards me. Um, and it was very important for me to, uh, to make sure that they understand that what happened to me, it's not for me to blame them. Uh, there are specific people who did specific things who I have every right to blame for what happened to me, but not them, you know. Um, and so I, 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 I became friends with some of them and we, we used to hang out. And then it was really interesting because then uh, I was there during the time that Kosovo declared independence. So then again, you saw this, not just even, of course they were very careful the way they spoke to me, but what was interesting for me to see is their interaction between their friends and the arguments that they had and who Kosovo belonged to. And I just looked at them and I said, do you realize that neither of you actually have never lived there? So, you know, why all of this taken of ownership, you know, around that, that area? And as I said before, you know, these things are being passed on and we need to look at how they're being passed on. And, but, you know, when you really um, look at these young people, you know, they, they really just want to go out and have friends and, you know, have fun. These, these were all 18, 19, 20 year olds. And, and it's, their reaction was mainly of what actually was uh, passed on to them and what they could do and couldn't do. And that story of the war was very much part of, uh, part of who they are. But, you know, for me, I had a different experience and I think it's down to because they already knew what I had uh, gone through and they really, it was all about how I approached them more than, than how they um, approached me. So I, I tried to learn out of all of these different experiences and how then do we interact with um, um, with young people? But I think just another thing that I wanted to, to mention that's sort of also been a discussion um, on the sort of last week or so, just being part of different conferences that touch up on dealing with the past and transitional justice. And I mean, I'm not too sure what it is like in, in uh, the other countries, but what I've noticed, for example, in, in, in Kosovo is that there's a lot of youth work in place, uh, but a lot of it, it's focused between um, young people in Kosovo who are Albanians and young people who are Serbs from Serbia. And I think we need to put a focus more within Kosovo in terms of how young people living in Kosovo interact with each other uh, from different communities, not just from the Albanian and Serbs, but also from, uh, uh, from other communities. For example, I was really shocked uh, in Parliament. Um, one of my colleagues, the head of the committee that I was in, she's Bosnian. 
And so she had this girl who was her assistant. And so I was talking to her. We were talking in English. We couldn't speak each other's language. And, and she told me that she lives in Prizren in this very small city. And there's no interaction between the uh, Bosnian young people living in Prizren with the Albanians. And, um, and for me, that's not right. Uh, that needs to, uh, uh, to change. So, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'd like to stay with you for, uh, for another question, Saranda, because it sits on the top of the agenda, it seems. Um, and, uh, but, but before responding to this question uh, directly, can you also um, uh, say a bit about uh, the exhibition itself? Um, uh, I had a chance to be there. I know a lot of people in the audience from the region also um, saw it and, and they know what it's about. Um, but for those who don't, um, um, can you say about the, the exhibition uh, that you did, uh, but, but also about uh, um, uh, why uh, and and uh, how the process looked like and I think that the the story of the, the that exhibition in Belgrade is is much wider than um, just if it's a Dutch coming there um, so let, let, let's focus on the the whole story instead. Yeah. Um, so with with um, my family, my cousins Johanna and Fatos, because it's always referred to as my exhibition, but it's actually the family's exhibition because we did it together. Um, uh, we, we had done a lot of work and we had done a lot of public speaking and even throughout the media. So we uh, decided that it was time to tell our story in our own way. And so uh, we opened an exhibition first in Pristina in 2011. It's called uh, Bogujevci Visual History. And the exhibition was really a homage to all the families that, that lost their loved ones during the war. And um, the idea was that uh, we didn't, as you mentioned, I, I totally agree with this whole number of things. So we didn't want to put numbers on how many people died or how many kids died or, you know, because they just stay numbers. There's, you know, they, they completely lose that aspect that they actually were human beings. And so we just wanted to tell our story and through our story for people to, uh, to be able to learn about other families. And so the exhibition had four rooms. Um, the first one was the living room. And uh, uh, out of everything that we had at home, and also we had this tradition of where they used to film us growing up, only one uh, videotape survived when I was five and we were celebrating New Year. So we wanted to tell we wanted to show people what our life was like uh, before the war. So uh, we placed the living room with the tape so people could go in and, and be in that same environment. And then we had the family tree, uh, which showed uh, the people that we lost during the war. This was also part of the exhibition was also the, uh, the Dorici family. This is a family friend family who, who was with us, who took shelter at our place, and unfortunately, Enver Durici lost his whole family, so his parents, wife, and four children. Um, so, of course, Enver's uh, uh, family tree was there as well. And, um, and then we had the hospital room, which told our story uh, of what we experienced during the war in, in hospital in Pristina. Uh, and the last one was the courtroom, where it showed our journey of recovery and all the trials that we uh, we took part in. Um, maybe just to explain, there were two trials in, in Belgrade, one in 2003, one in 2008, and in 2008, of course, was as a result, because more information came out for Srebrenica, which meant more information came out for us as well. This is the same unit. And uh, of course, at the um, ICTY on the uh, Vlastimir Djordjevic's case as well. And, uh, and then, of course, it showed of what we're doing now. And um, 
And then the same exhibition, uh, a year later we took it in Tehran, and in 2013 we managed to open it in Belgrade, at the Belgrade Cultural Center. Um, of course, this was through the support of um, Artifact Fund, Andrei Nosov, and uh, HLC, and Natasha. Um, it was a really tough journey because, unfortunately, at the beginning, before the opening of the exhibition, uh, there was a lot of media saying this is Albanian propaganda, and, and so uh, the gallery and the director uh, got me a second name. Um, and she, uh, she got a lot of death, death threats. And uh, we came to the point where they said, okay, there's no opening of the exhibition. And we said, well, we'll continue until the day to put it up. And if it doesn't open, we'll go somewhere else. And also just to explain that the, 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 uh, the reason why we wanted the exhibition in a public space publicly own uh, was because it changed the changes the audience and what we wanted is we wanted to reach to everyone not just a specific audience that would have an open mind as to and and willing to go and see the exhibition we really wanted to be at space where people you know um, from all different generations and, and different backgrounds would be interested to come in and see it um, of course, with the support of, of Natasha, we managed to, to open. And I think maybe it was probably about half an hour before or so the opening, we were told that uh, Ivica Dacic would come. Um, and to be honest with you, it was one of the most difficult things for us because we had to make a decision. And we thought, do we let him in? Or do we not let him in? Because this is a man that knew what happened. This is not someone who didn't know what was going on. And this is a man also that supported that regime that thousands and thousands of people died, not just in Kosovo, but uh, in Bosnia and other parts. Um, but then we made a decision that we would let him in. And so we showed him throughout the exhibition. Um, we didn't have any conversation with him. Uh, and Unfortunately, we didn't realize, but he made a statement at the end saying that, you know, we should do a joint memorial to commemorate everyone and that um, uh, apparently this was done by a group of people that took things in their own hands. And it's like, well, no, actually, because we've, there's been trials, there's been people convicted, and this is directly linked with the government of that time. But what was important for him to be there is that even though he didn't say it, it was a form of first time acknowledgement from institutions that, uh, you know, crimes were committed during the war and, you know, people were killed during the war. So it was very important for us, you know, um, uh, to have that. Um, and, but to be honest with you, it, this always comes up when we talk about the exhibition in Belgrade, but I think for us what was really important is to see the people who came to see the show. And you know, and it was really important and you saw, then, because of course then the course of the media changed and became huge news and then everyone got interested to come and see the exhibition. Uh, on the night of the uh, opening actually we, we had protests. Um, but um, you know, it was really important to see young moms with their children come and see the exhibition, young people, elderly, you know. Um, and also it was very interesting to see because we had a, a comments book. And uh, I was happy to see that, you know, there was only maybe two or three comments out of everything that probably were nasty, but that other people had crossed and wrote, you should be ashamed of yourself. So um, it was really important, you know. Uh, it was really important because as much as we talked about our story and it was covered by the media, and I used to look at the comments by people, there's always that but. You know, yes, I feel bad for what happened to you, but what about us? 
Um, and what was really important with the exhibition is that it was the first time where there was just a form of acknowledgement that, that these things took part, you know, and um, it wasn't just about which side or what. Uh, another thing that I want to mention is that um, what we didn't realize with the living room is that it's the first thing that people see when they walk into the exhibition, and it's the one place that everyone had a connection with. Everyone that walked into the living room, wherever we had the exhibitions, and oh my God, I didn't realize we used to live just exactly the same. You know, we used to have this, and my grandmother used to have this, and we used to have this book. And I think that was really important because people then realized that, you know, we were really living very similar lives. We were not that different from each other in those times. And um, yeah, and I think that that was um, that was really important. Um, I don't know if I missed anything else, but yeah, uh, that was. Uh, but to be honest with you, I think uh, apart from for us that it, we felt that that was a form of acknowledgement. Ivica's Dacic visit was not the most important thing about the exhibition. It was really people that got a chance to really learn something and really see what happened without what was being portrayed through the media or, you know. Uh, maybe just a little story, if you don't mind, I just wanted to share. It was really interesting uh, when there was um, a young man who came to collect the everything for the exhibition to take it to Belgrade. And so he came and we went and we met him um, um, by the border and we had to show him where to go to get everything and he said he was 19 when the war was happening in in, in Kosovo but you know it was really interesting he was very afraid he was you know he wasn't sure where he was what would happen how we would treat him and he knew very little English as well and of course we couldn't speak Serbian so you know communication was not the easiest but you know there was other things of just you know offering him to drink something and having a cigarette together and stuff. And, you know, it was really important, I think, also for him that he was just able to come in and get the stuff, but also really see how things were in, 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 in Kosovo. Because you could really see that the, the perception um, was not good, that, you know, um, and that interaction, I think, made, made a, a huge difference. But also I learned something out of it as well. Thank you. Um, I guess we should, uh, <clears throat> sorry, I guess we should talk politics a little bit, uh, questions out there. And uh, um, so, uh, and I really like the question. I mean, really, if, if it is the nationalists in power, election after election, um, uh, it's it's the right question to ask. Are the voters to blame too? Are the, the the people on the ground to blame too? So when when you engage in public service, when you engage in activism, um, uh, who are you speaking to? Are you are you speaking to the politicians, or are you speaking to to the people generally, or are you speaking to both? And 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 what is the 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 key message that you want them to? Uh, to take away uh, uh, after you intervene with them, after you um, uh, engage with them, uh, when you're given a platform um, to say what you want to say, to present um, your vision and your idea for, for your society or the region, um, uh, what do you want them to, to take away? First of all, when we speak, so I, I, I saw the question uh, about association. I'm not alone in Bosnia. Yeah, we have association, we have members, and we all work together. Uh, and um, when we talk, first of all, we talk with uh, society, because um, every time when we talk with society, we're trying to, to show them that uh, be child born out of rape, it's not just the uh, destiny of the Bosniak child is the destiny of the all nations and all ethnic groups in Bosnia and uh, we always want to show them that uh, 
that crimes uh, happen to all. You know, it's not the, the crime has a different size, uh, sides, and uh, when we talk with society, we're trying to explain them that uh, uh, we're trying to explain them uh, that if we watch the future from the different angle, you know, from the different uh, perspective, we can make it something, you know, because uh, this question here, uh, war crimes to the people who have done them and not them, okay. Uh, the point is that we want to show them that uh, there is no uh, way that we can uh, maybe just uh, delete the past, but we need to understand that this past happened to all of us, you know, and after that we want to, to, to change something but with society, because of that our voice go first to society and uh, there is the point of raising awareness and talking about everything and then together with society we talk with the politicians you know because uh, when we talk alone we are just one of the thousand who want to talk something you know but with, if you talk with society with uh, unique uh, message to the politicians I think that um, that can be the way that they really can hear us what we what we talk, but um, also our association when we talk with um, with uh, politician, the first question that uh, they ask uh, us how many Bosniak, how many Serbian, how many Croatian members you have, and I told them like we have hundreds and hundreds human beings in our association. Thank you, and that's all that I can answer to these guys. Ja vrlo slabo imam ovaj, priliku sa političarima da imam susret, ali najviše imam susret jel, sa omladinom, to jest po školama, u Italiju po najviše, ovaj, ali uvek šaljem poruku da oni ne slušaju političare, nego da prave svoju budućnost, svoju viziju, i da ne gledaju čoveka po boji kože, po naciji, po imenu. I to je jedna moja poruka koju uvek govorim u školama i mojim prijateljima. Nažalost, političarima nisam imao prilike, iako sam pokušao dva, tri puta da govorim, da pokušam da dođem da govorim ili u parlamentu, ili čak u, u kantonu našem Tuzlanskom. Međutim, uvijek je do, dobio sam odgovor da se ne može, da ne mogu, ili da jednostavno nema vremena za to da pričam o, o mojoj životnoj priči, o pomirenju i tako dalje, što i ujedno i govori da oni ne žele da ja pričam o pomirenju. A da li neko drugi priča o mržnji, za njih uvijek ima vremena, a ima i taki dosta u Bosni i Hercegovini koji pričaju, nažalost, o mržnji. A ja nisam taj koji sam među njima, nego sam jednostavno čovjek koji govori o pomirenju. Um, so I really didn't have the opportunity to speak with any of the politicians. Uh, however, most of the time I would speak to children, especially at schools, in Italy especially. Uh, the message that I send, uh, the, the message that I receive is that the politicians don't really want to hear uh, any of my thoughts. Uh, but what I always say is to, uh, for people to create your own future, create your own destiny, and don't see people uh, as of their color or nation. Um, however, I didn't have the chance to speak to any politician. I have tried, though. I tried speaking to the assembly. I tried to speak at least in my canton of Tuzla. Uh, however, the answers was always that we have no time to speak 
uh, to speak of reconciliation, and that says that probably the politicians don't want to speak about reconciliation, but when it comes to hate, they are all ears. Uh, however, I'm a person who prefers speaking on reconciliation. Thank you. I think I'm in a tricky position now. <laughs> um, just so that for the ones that don't know, on the, um, on the 2017 election, I ran for the first time as member of parliament through uh, the party of uh, movement for self-determination. Um, which I managed to get in and just recently have been re-elected. Uh, and of course, a lot of things have changed because the party also uh, won this time. Um, to be honest with you, when it comes to um, the subject of, of dealing with the past, um, I'm not a politician. I don't see myself as representing politics. Um, and but it's really good to be in a place and in a platform where you can actually try and do something about it. Um, and so in the last um, couple of years uh, within the parliament, um, I've tried um, to do really kind of maybe more listen to um, families of missing persons, um, um, the uh, victims of sexual violence and and really look at it, what we need to do to, to uh, what I said earlier, make, make things easier for them. Um, I have to say I'm lucky enough that actually throughout the work that I did, um, I had the, uh, the support of the party because I think otherwise it would be quite difficult. Um, and so also what I realized is that being within the institutions, I had different role and I had a different responsibility. So it wasn't anymore about criticizing and asking what you're doing about it, whoever was in government. But for me, being within the parliament, I realized that, okay, now I need to think about actually how I can help and support them to do the best job that they can, or if they're not doing anything, what can we push for them? Or if they're saying, okay, they have the will, but not maybe the knowledge or the, the, the means to do it. What do we do to, uh, to help them out? One example at the moment, because um, there, there was a law that was passed uh, for the recognition of uh, victims of sexual violence and they get a, a, a small pension. But there's many uh, issues with the commission, uh, not because it's the fault of the commission. And unfortunately, um, there was, they were blamed a lot throughout this process. So what, when I met with them, I realized that, okay, hold on a second, we need to also um, support them. Uh, they didn't have the financial means to do the work that they needed to do. They didn't have uh, a lot of the support that they, they, um, they needed. So now, also with, hopefully, you know, uh, getting the government uh, going, uh, for me, it's really important then how do we push that um, that forward. But I think when it comes to, to politics, um, it's really important that you identify people who are willing, even if it's individuals within, whether it's political parties or within government, you, you, you just see that person, you grab hold of that person, and then you use that person to to try to push things that, um, uh, that are important. Um, but what I realized, sometimes even as politician, even if you have the will and you want to change things, unfortunately you can't do it on your own. So you need the people to do that, you know, with, uh, and, uh, and the support and the voice. Uh, so it's a two-way thing, to be honest. Um, but also I always think because, of course, there's many aspects of, you know, uh, things that didn't work out in, in Kosovo for the last 20 years. And, and I always say to people, you know, we fought and um, at harder times. And I mean by, you know, not just 
taking arms and fighting during the war, but you know, um, in, in other ways, for example, when I started school during the 90s, my school was taken away, there was other forms that people then joined forces and were able to provide an education for me. So, you know, uh, even when times were harder, so I said to people, you know, I understand that a lot of people have gone through a lot, but if you want to change something, you have to be part of that change. Change doesn't come when we wait for the others or expect the others to do something for us, unfortunately. The, it would be great to do that, but it doesn't work that way. And it's collectively as well. You can't do things on your own. And I learned that, you know, all the things that I've been able to do throughout my life, it's as a result of so many people behind me that most of the times the names never get mentioned, you never see their faces, but they're always there. Uh, and that's how you, you get to, to make change. Um, and um, yeah, and just finding different ways. And it's not easy, I'm not saying. It's never easy, but you have to take that, um, that first step. And honestly, you know, waiting on politics to make changes, it's not always um, the way to go and it all doesn't always happen. And also you have to understand that everyone has their own agenda. So how do you find that person that has the same agenda as you? And how do you get then other people who are interested in that get together and push that um, forward? So um, just to give one example, in, in, so I was part of the Committee for Human Rights, Gender Equality, Missing Persons and, and Petitions. And so a lot of the times I would use my own experience and my story to um, argue about certain things and also use that to also really, I wouldn't say educate, but really for my colleagues to understand about things. So for example, when it came to, to the families of the missing persons and, and uh, victims of sexual violence, you know, I kept constantly preaching saying, a pension is not enough. It's a little help, little financial help. But for these people, it's beyond that. It's how do we support them on daily lives with whatever they are going through and what they need. And, and also I would say that the reason why I am where I am and I can be who I am, it's because I had all that kind of support throughout, um, throughout my journey. Um, so it's, it's using then, you know, examples like that to, to be able also to get people to, to understand. Sometimes it doesn't work, sometimes it works, but you have to do it. But honestly, change, change happens when, when people also want change and they take things in their hands and say, okay, we've had enough of you. And um, yeah, we can do something different. Now, um, well, um, everybody here in the audience basically is a um, driven, ambitious uh, young person who uh, wants to do good, um, uh, who wants to contribute to something good in their uh, communities and their societies. Um, but not every young, pe young person uh, wishing to do good necessarily has a, um, a clear vision um, of, of where they want to go, what they're striving for. Yet the three of you, when you speak, um, the, the, the clarity of your vision just radiates. So if, if I may ask you for, for the closing round, um, and actually inspired by something that um, Aina recently um, said, I'd like to, um, to read that um, uh, recently. Uh, she won an award of the, the University of Sarajevo, where, where you also went to. Um, and in the end of your uh, speech there, you said, um, I've chosen the path of humanity. Um, my mother told me that uh, it is only humanity uh, that can win uh, against evil. And in her name, in the name of my hero, um, I invite you all tonight to build a society of equal values and not a society of different labels. 
Um, I'm sorry if now I stole your uh, um, uh, your answer to the question I'm just about to ask, but I, I would really like the three of you to share briefly um, your vision and what do you think these young people um, here can do to support it, um, uh, to help you build um, your communities and, and this region to be fairer and, and more just and, and more peaceful. So, um, on the end, uh, the, my message is that uh, I'm here today with you to not just to share, but to give you my story, give you my experience, give you everything that I am. But um, the point is that um, on the end, I will tell you, I need you and you need me. We need to be together in this, and uh, or we can stay together in this bad world that we live now, but uh, on the end, we, you, know, you need to know that this fight for peace, this fight for better future, uh, you know, I cannot do this alone. And uh, the point is that we need to show that we can be together and that we can make a society of equal values because, um, believe me, I was in the darkest place of this, on this world. and. Uh, and it's so, it's hard, it's, it's enough to say that it's hard. And believe me that uh, you don't want to be there. You want to be in the better place. And uh, let's go there together. Thank you. Uh, moja poruka je kratka. Uh, nemojte se mrziti, jednostavno se volite i živite u budućnosti, gradite budućnost bolju nego što smo mi i naši što su radili. My message is short, don't hate each other, love each other, live in the future and build a better one than we did and the ones that were before us. Thank you. Well, to go after um, Zio, yeah, uh, learn from us. We didn't get anything out of what we experienced apart from uh, pain and suffering, so that could be one lesson. Um, I really believe that together, um, hearing each other out and um, learning from each other, um, it's, it's really important. And also joining forces. And also don't be afraid to say, um, no, this is not right. No, this is not I want to be part of. And, um, you know, um, think about what you, what you think the, the future should, um, should be. You know, it's not about what we say it's the future should be. It's, it's about you. Um, and as, again, as I said before, it's fine to be proud of who you are. Keep that. But then use that to learn from each other and to learn about the proudness of the other and what we have in com common and, um, yeah, and how we moved forward. But it's really about saying what you want instead of what others say you should be, or you should be living like. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, uh, for again, uh, your time and coming here and sharing. Uh, this was the, the, the first time in years that I was um, actually very nervous uh, about engaging in a, in a conversation and, and moderating a panel. Um, 
but uh, I would like to say two things in closing. One is that if we've at all succeeded with the intention of this panel, all three of you now have a new room full of allies. And, um, and I invite all the young people here, the, the, the participants of the summit, um, to use the rest of the time um, here and, and your time here. Uh, to engage more with you about how um, they can follow you, how they can support you, um, how they can amplify uh, the messages that you're uh, promoting in their communities and through their work. And uh, the other thing that I would like to say um, um, in closing is that um, um, I know it must be discouraging when um, we see people like my current president or President Vucic glorify war criminals and um, deny the, 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 the pain of victims um, uh, and, and their families and communities around them. But, um, but what I think is important to remember and what I want you to, um, to remember as well is that while those people like my president or President Vucic uh, may be supported in what they're doing in their small, close-minded communities, as soon as they leave them, they're alone. Uh, whereas you, with your stories and your notions and your visions, um, I'm sure uh, that, that they resonate with the, with the very core uh, of, uh, of every human person everywhere. Um, so I, I just wanted to, to say that in closing um, uh, to the three of you. So thank you so much for, for everybody's attention. Thank you for, uh, for your questions and uh, um, uh, I guess you will announce the lunch. <laughs> Uh, I would firstly uh, like to thank once again all of the participants for their sharing a part of their fight, which at first glance does look like a really futile task, but all of their speeches really made our hearts skip a beat. And I have two very, very important announcements. The first one, in your printed out uh, booklets, there has been a mistake. Um, actually, the workshop, Digital Security, uh, is uh, taking part in the pocket cinema, whereas the other workshop is taking part in the upper foyer. And now I would like to invite you all to lunch. Have a nice meal. <laughs>